It's just before 3 p.m. on Monday, May 7, 2018. Teen Bailey Bagshaw grabs the family's mail from the hanging mailbox at the side of her home in Salt Lake City and steps through the front entrance. Bailey has just returned from school and makes a call to her mother, Shauna, to talk about something important, something that has been eating away at her for many months. At 3 p.m. on a weekday, Bailey would be home alone. But someone beside her mother already knew that. She plops the mail down on the kitchen counter and starts sifting through it with one hand, the other hand on her phone. The two are just getting into the heat of the conversation when Shauna hears what would forever change her life. Her daughter, screaming. Then, silence. Salt Lake City, the capital of the state of Utah. It was founded in 1847 by Mormon pioneers led by Brigham Young, and so serves as a residential and tourist hub for Mormons, followers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The city has incredible views of mountains and has amenities like skiing and outdoor activities that have made it a prime tourist destination for many people. Despite the state's general conservative leaning, Given its strong religious convictions, Salt Lake is considered more politically liberal. It is here where our story takes us. Bailey Shea Bagshaw, nicknamed Baby Bear, was born on November 4, 2002, to Troy and Shauna Bagshaw. She attended the Utah Military Academy, the Northwest Middle School, and was most recently a freshman at West High School. She was passionate about drama club, photography, and animals. In fact, her dream was to train service animals. Her mom entered dog grooming competitions. Yes, those kinds. She loved styling her hair and singing. She enjoyed babysitting in the time she had outside of school extracurriculars, and worked at the Leatherby's family creamery in the city. She ultimately wanted a career in the military. She had a sister named Miranda Cannon and a brother named Cavan Cannon. Her father passed away before the events that are the subject of the story. Bailey had a former boyfriend named Carson Hennifer, the relationship with which lasted somewhere between late 2015 and January 2017, according to Carson. On May 7, 2018, just before 3 p.m., Bailey walked up the front steps of her home at 1628 West 500 North, picked up the mail from the hanging box on the left side of the door, and entered the property. She made a beeline to the kitchen, where she phoned her mother, Shauna. The discussion she wanted to have was extremely serious. It had been something she was holding in for months and only recently started opening up about to her mother, siblings, and friends. Before she could even get to it, however, and as she was staring down at the kitchen counter where she dropped the mail, she was violently attacked from behind. Her screaming can be heard by her mother, who would have had to audibly endure the entirety of her daughter's final few moments on earth. The attacker then fled, leaving a trail of blood. Hearing the struggling, screaming, and gasping for air from her daughter, Shauna immediately called 911. Before police arrived, a neighbor, who heard the screams, went to check the residence. When the neighbor peeked inside, they saw blood trailing toward the front door, prompting them to also call police. Shauna noted to police that while she was on the phone with Bailey, she heard Bailey's phone ring multiple times. As police entered the residence, they noticed the door was slightly ajar. Entering further, they saw blood pooling from the edge of the kitchen. Bailey had multiple defensive slash wounds on her hands, multiple stab wounds on her back and torso, but her death was likely the result of the gaping wound in her neck. In fact, the attacker had slashed her neck several times, severing her carotid artery and jugular vein, 
which would have resulted in a water fountain-like effect from her neck as her heart pounded blood through the wound. Blood sprayed the kitchen and the attacker as the brute continued cutting through her neck. From ear to ear, she had nearly been decapitated. The final autopsy report posited a cause of death as sharp force injuries, with several lacerations to the front of her neck, a deep stab wound to the back of her neck, a stab wound to her left shoulder, a stab wound to the center of her neck just above the clavicle, and lacerations to her fingers. The amount of blood suggested to police that there was absolutely no way the attacker would have been able to flee the scene without any amount of DNA on them. So the search began. There's Maverick, and there's Goose. That's that's me, and I don't know if I call her my ex, but that was me and my girlfriend. Um, her name's Bailey Bagshaw, and unfortunately, she was she was uh, she passed away. Um, yeah, she she's no longer with us. Uh, later that day, I didn't go to school. I had some problems. I, everything was pretty good. Get a call at like eight, and they said, "Uh, hey, this is Carson Hennifer." I said, "Yeah." They said, "All right, well, are you home?" I said, "Yeah." I know we need to come talk to you. Who the hell is this? This is detective, whoever name, and uh, yeah, I need we need to talk to you. So within thirty minutes, the SWAT team was at my door, and I still remember vividly. They they said um, they pulled my mom aside because they won't talk to my mom, and then my mom was crying. I was like. Like, you know, I didn't think this is what's going to happen, you know. And they said, hey, uh, do you want to tell her? Tell him that the guy asked my mom, and my mom's like, no, no, no. So the, the SWAT guy, I'm sitting, he's like, sit down, sit on your couch. So I'm sitting on my couch, and he's like, there was a homicide in Salt Lake today. And Bailey was the victim. Um, and then from there, I was questioned for about two and a half hours, three hours. And, uh, yeah, they, it was awful. I mean, I didn't know what the hell just happened. Investigators were moving quickly to interview as many people as possible who were close to Bailey, understanding that the suspect was likely on the move. A knife attack of this severity suggested that it was personal. As investigators were canvassing the crime scene, they were able to retrieve a knife, which was hidden in the backyard of the house. No other items of interest were located in or around the property. However, because of the volume of blood left behind, investigators were able to get a boot print of the suspect. But the print was useless without the actual boot. It would only be a couple of days after the murder where police would catch a massive break. In a dumpster found at a landfill was a black backpack with bloody clothes, rubber and latex gloves, duct tape, a balaclava, and bloody boots. The police had received tips to search there, and between 20 and 25 officers searched it for nearly 10 hours. Court documents referred to the discovery as, quote, miraculous, because it wasn't just the fact that the crucial evidence was in a landfill. It was also the fact that this was the Uinta County landfill, located in Wyoming. Sean French was destitute. He had been depressed, homeless, and looking for a kind soul in the state and city known for its religiously inclined hospitality and generosity. Sean Patrick French was born on August 5, 1993 to Floyd Foster. He has a brother named Cody and a sister named Jeanne. He grew up in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and went to Chakahatchee High School. He worked at a Utah landscaping company called Intermountain Plantings. According to his Facebook profile, he was just a chill, blue-collar guy who liked comedy, superhero movies, anime, and video games. And it appeared he had fallen into hard times. In January 2017, however, Shauna Bagshaw would be the one to take pity on him. After all, he was a family friend. The two struck up a conversation, hearing his story, Shauna welcomed him into the Bagshaw household if he wanted to stay. All of a sudden, Sean's fortunes began to change. He now had shelter. At this time, he also announced in a January 9 Facebook post that he was in a relationship. Though, he responded later in that post saying that it was a false alarm. 
Bailey was likely reeling from her breakup with Carson, which was the same month Sean moved in. Bailey now had to also deal with the sudden influx of boys in the home, Sean and her brother, 21-year-old Cavan, who moved in in February 2021. It's unclear whether Cavan moving in was a coincidence or whether it was deliberate to ensure that there was sort of a counter male in the home because of the male stranger now under the same roof as at least two females. In any event, things were a bit tight. If three's a crowd, then this was really awkward, if not uncomfortable. But the Bagshaws were a generous family. What would Jesus do kind of attitude. So they all dealt with it. Things moved along like normal. Then one day in February, as Sean was getting to know the family more, he struck up a conversation with Bailey. That conversation would morph into occasional chats that became regular rendezvous. After a breakup, some people will feel isolated, alone, even hated. They are generally more vulnerable in this position and may seek to find love sooner rather than later. Bailey likely felt the same. Fresh off her breakup with Carson, she may have felt comfort in Sean's affection toward her. But this wasn't a simple, I will be your emotional towel type of relationship. This was more. Sean and Bailey began having a secret romantic relationship. Meanwhile, police would catch another massive break in the case. It turned out that the brother of a person of interest in the case had called to say that the person they were looking for was in Colorado. It was Wednesday, May 9, two days after the murder. The suspect had indeed been on the move. They had traveled east, first hitting neighboring Wyoming and then heading toward the end destination of South Carolina. The suspect's father was in the car with him. The father testified that the suspect had been trying to get his life back together. On May 3, 2018, the two had traveled to visit an ex-girlfriend of his. In July 2017, after six months in the Bagshaw household, Sean left and moved to Ohio to stay with his dad. But the secret relationship between Sean and Bailey would continue. Sean would secretly return to the home and have various forms of sex with Bailey. After several months of this, Bailey called off the relationship. She would say she just wasn't feeling comfortable with it anymore. Meanwhile, Carson said he and Bailey had started talking again in January 2018, dating again in March 2018. But Carson knew something wasn't right with Bailey. One late April 2018 day, Bailey called Carson and shyly asked if she could tell him about something. She said that Sean had made threats against her. She told Carson that she didn't have feelings for Sean, but that he would not let their relationship end. So we're talking back again in January 2018. So I started dating her in March of this year, and she told me about a guy named Sean French. And she told me about this guy, and I was like, "All right, well, what about like what about him?" Like, she told me he was a bad guy. He was stalking her. He was really creepy, and she was trying to get away from this guy. He had previously forced himself on her and had threatened to send nude photos of her to everyone in her family. You see, Sean wasn't really the shy guy that he may have portrayed himself to win Shauna's kindness. Sean was belligerent. Kevin didn't feel comfortable with Sean being around his sister, but Sean would taunt Kevin by having sex with Bailey in areas of the home that Kevin would find them. Sean once remarked that Bailey was amazing in bed and was amazing at, quote, giving head. Kevin had walked in on Sean and Bailey having various types of sex on three different occasions, he would say. The relationship wasn't just a sexual one, though. It was a pseudo-husband and wife one in which Bailey would be forced to make Sean food and would not allow her to talk to other men or have others over at home, including her friends. In January 2018, before their official breakup, Sean had asked Bailey to send him nude photographs of her. Bailey complied, sending 14 such photos. Sean would use these photos as leverage over Bailey, who was trying to find her way back into Carson's life. Sean had threatened to send all those photos to her family and post them all over social media. On March 12, 
Over Facebook, Sean threatened to kill himself if Bailey left him, a standard manipulation tactic. Bailey had confided in her friend Michaela in mid-April 2018 that Sean was threatening suicide if she didn't take him back. Bailey told Michaela that Sean was too controlling. She said he didn't like when she hung out with her friends. Again, another manipulation tactic to isolate the victim from help. Then, he took it a step further. He threatened to kill Bailey. Still one step more, he threatened to kill her whole family. Sean's plan was being scuttled. He had expressed his desire to marry Bailey. Some acquaintances said he was, quote, obsessed with her. There was just one small problem with Sean's plan to marry Bailey. This is a photo of Bailey holding her learner permit, a step toward obtaining her full driver's license. The significance of the photo may not be clear because I haven't been explicit so far with certain details of the story, though some may have put two and two together. To that, I applaud you. To be eligible for a learner permit in Utah, you must be at least 15 years old. Bailey was 15 years old in 2018. Bailey was a minor when she was killed. The timer on Bailey's final days evidently began the moment 23-year-old Sean French met Shauna Bagshaw. The month after entering the Bagshaw home, Sean had committed a third-degree felony by having intercourse with Bailey, who was just 14 years old at the time the relationship began. By the time he was kicked out in July 2017, he was facing three counts of unlawful sexual activity with a minor, stemming from sexual activity between February 1 and April 10, according to court records. He was trying to silence Bailey. Detectives this afternoon obtained a third degree felony warrant for Sean French for unlawful sexual activity with a minor. Um, the warrant extends from a relationship he had with the victim. In April 2017, Cavan could not take the taunting any longer. He phoned the police, telling them that Sean was having sexual relations with his little sister. When police came to speak with Bailey and Sean, both denied the relationship. Perhaps Bailey was under Sean's spell. Or threats. Sean was allowed to stay in the household a little longer before he was kicked out by Shauna in July 2017. In November 2017, Bailey finally told Sean on Facebook that the relationship was illegal and they had to stop it. Sean persisted. Bailey continued the relationship she wasn't so sure of. Two months later, she sent the nude photos to him. It was then that Carson and Bailey started talking again. And in March 2018, Bailey tried breaking up with Sean for good. She had finally blocked him on Facebook. Sean didn't take this well, at all. He had asked a friend to help him create a number of anonymous Facebook accounts to tell her that Sean was going to kill himself if she left him. He would call her from different phone numbers and would not leave her alone. He told her he would kill her uncle and grandmother. Bailey wasn't phased. Perhaps he was bluffing. But Sean was panicking. Bailey had told him she would tell police about the relationship. Sean, evidently, had been trying to isolate and threaten Bailey so the truth wouldn't come out. In late April 2018, Carson encouraged Bailey to go to the police about the relationship and assured her she wouldn't get in trouble because she's a minor. Just days before her murder on May 2, Bailey finally gathered the strength to tell her mother about the relationship. She told her mother about Sean's threats to leak her photos on social media. They were expected to discuss the next steps on the afternoon she was murdered. That day, the ringing on Bailey's phone that Shauna heard was from Sean, who tried calling her 13 times. Sean, already chronically depressed, had been spiraling. His house of cards made up of an illicit and illegal relationship with a girl of his dreams was folding. When Bailey ignored Sean's final attempt to keep her, that is, when he threatened to kill her family, he went into a state of madness that lasted over a week. I'm done, he told Bailey over Facebook. I want you to suffer, so enjoy. 
the diabolical plan was put into motion. I was like, all right, well, what can I do to help you? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know what to do in this situation. I said, you got to tell your mom. So I got her to tell her mom. And then they, they tried confronting the guys saying, hey, you know, like, don't appreciate it. Can you just back off? He's like, oh, yeah, whatever. And everything was kind of fine. And within two weeks of a week and a half of that, I don't really remember. I yeah, It was uh, May 6th after I uploaded that video, my last video. May 7th in that morning, I texted Bailey. I said, hey, did that guy talk to you? He said, no, no, that guy didn't talk to me. I said, oh, okay, cool, cool. Are we still hanging out Friday? He said, yeah, 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 we'll hang out. It's Thursday, May 3, 2018. Sean is sitting in his Ohio bedroom typing away. He is rocking back and forth in his chair, beads of sweat running down his forehead. He is muttering to himself. He can barely sit still. He is uploading nude photos of Bailey with a fake Facebook profile pretending to be Carson. The target is Shauna. He hits send. It is the point of no return. He then pulls up a profile of an acquaintance in Utah and begins typing. In it, he tells the person he needs, quote, help. He says he is, quote, going to kill someone. Then he shuts down his computer, gets up, and gets dressed. He packs a backpack, some snacks, and goes downstairs. He calls out to his dad and tells him he is getting in the car. His dad, Floyd, oblivious to what he is scheming, is to accompany Sean on a trip to South Carolina. But Sean tells Floyd he is going to first make a stop to visit his ex-girlfriend in Utah first, which is in the complete opposite direction of South Carolina. Floyd later told police that Sean told him he was trying to get his life back together after the breakup, and that he was going to confront Bailey about a grape allegation. Sean sets his GPS for Salt Lake City, a 1,600-mile, 25-hour drive west. And so begins their multi-day journey across the country. Meanwhile, Bailey begins opening up about the illicit relationship to her mom, Shauna. Bailey feels relieved that Sean is now in Ohio and feels it easier to now speak freely. That day, May 3, Bailey and Shauna make plans to call the police after Shauna received the nude photos. For some reason, though, they do not call police immediately. Perhaps there was a feeling that Sean had physically distanced himself from them. As Sean is driving across state lines, he calls his brother Cody. He is in complete shambles. He is already committed to what he is about to do. He just wants to part with some final words. I effed up, he tells Cody. I had sex with a minor and I'm going to go to prison on grape charges. I'm going to be extradited to Utah to face those charges. Cody, I'm not well, man. I've been depressed. I want to cut my throat. After three days of driving, Sean arrives in Salt Lake on the afternoon of Sunday, May 6, one day before the killing. Sean and Floyd spend parts of Sunday afternoon and Monday morning and afternoon relaxing at a park near where Bailey lives. Perhaps Sean thought this was his last few days of freedom. On Monday afternoon, after sitting for a while on a park bench, Sean gets up and tells his dad he is going to be right back. He grabs the black backpack he brought with him. As he's walking away, he takes one look back at his dad. He then walks to Bailey's house, kneels next to the side of the house and dons a balaclava, gloves, and pulls a knife and duct tape out of his bag. He then breaks into her home and hides. Meanwhile, Bailey says bye to some school friends and hops on a bus just after 2.30 p.m. She walks the rest of the distance home, climbs a short flight of stairs, and grabs the mail before making her way in. Minutes later, the afternoon quiet is shattered by muffled screams. After being satisfied that she was gone, Sean, whose heart is racing, quickly exits the home, his clothes, hands, and face covered in blood. He makes a left turn after walking down the front porch stairs and makes his way around the back of the house where he hides the knife. He then returns to the park where his dad stands frozen. He sees the condition his son is in. We have to leave, Sean tells Floyd. 
I cut the girl's throat. I damn near cut her head off, he excitedly says. Sean then takes Floyd for a ride east to Evanston, Wyoming. There, they stop at a gas station where Sean takes off his bloody clothes and puts it in the backpack and then discards it in a dumpster. He then calmly enters the store and makes a straight line to the bathroom where he washes his face and hands. At some point between the murder and Wednesday, May 9, Sean confesses to his family friends about the murder. Excusez-moi, sorry. I mean he brags about it. After hearing the news and Sean's confession, Cody asks how he killed her. Sean replies by comparing it to the time Cody cut off the head of a wounded deer. On May 9, Cody has finally heard enough. He picks up the phone and calls the police. He tells them that Sean is in Colorado and that they need to move quickly before he flees. Cody would later testify against Sean in court. After a two-day manhunt, it was there, on US 50 near County Road 13 in southeast Colorado, that Sean was finally arrested. While in custody, he further bragged on a recorded call with Cody about how his kill was the most important case to ever happen in Utah, and that he had federal authorities chasing him across state lines. Oh dude, I've dwarfed the three killers that were here before me for aggravated murder. Nobody even knew they were effing here. <laughs> yeah, everybody and their sister knew who I was. Sean was charged with aggravated murder, aggravated burglary, sexual exploitation of a minor, and obstruction of justice, in part because he was recorded on a jail call saying that the witnesses to which he confessed to the killing should just forget he told them what he said. I'm, I'm not kidding. On November 8, 2019, the prosecution, having looked at the overwhelming evidence, filed a notice of intent to seek the death penalty. However, on July 1, 2020, seeing the same overwhelming evidence, Sean is advised by his attorneys about a plea deal, which he accepts. The deal avoids a lengthy trial in exchange for taking death off the table. The two sides agree to a guilty plea on aggravated murder, but dismissed other charges, including the second-degree felony sexual exploitation of a minor. Sean Patrick French was sentenced in August 2020 to life without parole. The conclusion of the sentencing memorandum summed up the case succinctly. Quote, The defendant is fortunate to have been offered any resolution short of a death sentence. In the end, in a cruel twist of fate, Sean Patrick French got what he wanted in a sense. He will not officially be labeled as a sex offender. Sean would rather you believe that he was a child murderer than a child molester. Of course, he may have a difficult time educating inmates about that. Thus concludes the story of a deeply troubled person who would go the length, literally in distance traveled and figuratively, to conceal behavior that damaged a child and likely would have scarred her for life had she lived to tell the tale. There's nothing much else to say except that Bailey never stood a chance. Her family came to court and lined the front row, plenty of tissues in hand as they wept during testimony. Sean French repaid the kindness offered to him by the generous Spagshaw family by destroying the life of their child. An emotional roller coaster, a lot of sadness. There's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't think about her or, you know, wish I could have done something different. I wish I could have gone back and had a do over, but I can't. I can't change the past. One of the things that I emphasize with parents of teenagers, especially girls, is that take their cell phones and know all their passwords, you know, um, know who they're chatting with. And if she could have one more chat with her daughter, she'd say three simple but meaningful words. I love you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate the story. Court testimony was based on secondary sources, while the rest of the story is based solely on the primary sources, including police reports and court documents. Special nod goes to the reporters who get information to the public first, and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter. If you liked the video, eh, 
Maybe give it a like. It helps. In the meantime, be safe. Know the signs of manipulation. And of course, don't be Sean Patrick French. Goodbye.